I'm Brian Bankson from the Cinco Ranch Branch Library, and welcome to Episode 9 of What Makes This Photograph Great, where we analyze point by point, element by element, pixel by pixel, what makes a photograph worth looking at. Each episode, I choose a master photographer and focus on a particular photograph from their repertoire that I really dig. Today we're going to look at American street photographer Vivian Mayer. The remarkable thing about this photographer is that her work wasn't discovered until after she died. Her negatives were bought at an auction of her possessions in a storage unit she rented in 2007. Here's her story. Many details of Mayer's life remain unknown. She was born in New York City in 1926, the daughter of a French mother, Maria Jassaud Justine, and an Austrian father, Charles Mayer. Her father seems to have left the family temporarily for unknown reasons by 1930. In the 1930 census, the head of the household was listed as Jean Bertrand, a successful photographer who knew Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitley, founder of the Whitney Museum of American Art. When Mayer was four, she and her mother moved to the Bronx with Bertrand. In 1951, age 25, Mayer moved from France to New York, where she worked in a sweatshop. She moved to the Chicago's North Shore area in 1956, where she worked primarily as a nanny for the next 40 years. In her first 17 years in Chicago, Mayer worked as a nanny for two, family, two families, the Ginsburgs from 1956 to 1972, and the Raymonds from 1967 to 1973. Lane Ginsberg later said of Mare, she was like a real, live Mary Poppins, and said she never talked down to the kids and was determined to show them the world outside their affluent suburb. The families who employed her described her as very private and reported that she spent her days off walking the streets of Chicago and taking photographs, usually with a Roloflex camera. In 1959 and 1960, Mayer embarked on a solo trip around the world, taking pictures in Los Angeles, Manila, Bangkok, Shanghai, Beijing, India, Syria, Egypt, and Italy. The trip was probably financed by the sale of a family farm. For a brief period in the 1970s, Mayer worked as a housekeeper for talk show host Phil Donahue. She kept her belongings at her employers. At one residence, she had 200 boxes of materials, most contained photographs or negatives, but Mayer also collected newspapers in at least one instance. It involved shoulder-high piles. She also re recorded audio tapes of conversations she had with people she photographed. The Ginsburg brothers, whom Mayer had looked after as children, tried to help her as she became destitute in old age. When she was about to be evicted from her apartment, the Ginsburg brothers arranged for her to live in a better apartment on Sheridan Road in the Rogers Park area of Chicago. In November, in November of 2008, Mayer fell on the ice and hit her head. She was taken to a hospital but failed to recover. In January 2009, she was transported to a nursing home in the Chicago suburbs where she died on April 21st. In 2007, two years before she died, Mayer failed to keep up payments on a storage space she had rented on Chicago's north side. As a result, her negatives, prints, audio recordings, and 8mm film were auctioned. Three photo collectors bought parts of her work, John Maloof, Ron Slatterly, and Randy Prow. Mayer's photographs were first published on the internet in July of 2008 by Slatterly, but their work re received little response. Maloof had bought the largest part of Mayer's work, about 30,000 negatives, because he was working on a book about the history of the Chicago neighborhood of Portage Park. Maloof later bought more of Mayer's photographs from another buyer at the same auction. Maloof discovered Mayer's name in his boxes, but was unable to discover anything about her until a Google search led him to Mayer's death notice in the Chicago Tribune in April of 2009. In October 2009, Maloof linked his blog to a selection of Mayer's photographs on Flickr. They became a viral phenomenon with thousands of people expressing interest. 
Since her posthumous discovery, Mayer's photographs and their discovery have received international attention in mainstream media, and her work has appeared in gallery exhibitions, several books, and documentary films. So now, let's take a look at a few photographs from Vivian Mayer. Normally in this series, I pick a singular photograph to critique from a master artist. But in this video, we're going to do something a little different. What is impressive about Vivian Mayer is a sheer number of wonderful photographs she took. Tens of thousands of them. Even picking out a few to show is difficult. So I picked out a few of my favorites that illustrates her mastery of both street photography and even a bit of surrealism. None of her photographs have titles. It's not even clear if she ever got to see these printed. The first thing you might notice is the high quality of the photograph compared to other street photographers of the time. This is because she used a medium format Roloflex camera instead of a 35mm camera used by most street photographers. The larger negative gives it the higher quality and clarity. In this photo, you can see the use of the rule of thirds in both the placement of the subject and horizon line. I love this photograph because of the surreal quality to it. It's just a photograph of a man taking a nap on a beach, but at first glance, it feels odd and unsettling. The next photograph feels the same way, odd and unsettling. It's entirely possible that both uh, of these photographs were posed, but looking at her collection entirely, I very much doubt it. Vivian was very much a street photographer. She most likely happened upon a man sleeping in his car and just took a photograph through the open window. If you remember back to the first video in the series, I mentioned that there are two types of photographers, ones that make pictures and ones that take pictures. Vivian definitely takes pictures. I love mystery boxes, and that's what made this photograph great, the sense of mystery. What could possibly be in that box? The answer would probably be disappointing, but we will never know. I love the storytelling aspect to this photograph, and the fact that she just came across this scene with her camera at hand is just so amazing. And not only this scene, but thousands of others. One of the masters of street photography was Henri Cartier-Bresson, who coined the term decisive moment. That one fraction of an instant in time street photographers are always chasing. It's easier now in the digital area where you can take a burst of 10 or 20 exposures in hopes that one will catch that decisive moment, but you don't have that luxury with film. But Vivian struck gold with this one, catching the boy's hand right above the cat's head and the blissful expression on that cat's face. Just wonderful. Vivian had quite a few self-portraits in her collection, usually using reflections or her shadow falling in the frame. This one is a, is a this one is a particularly exquisite one. I'm not entirely sure if this is a double exposure or not, where two exposures are made on one frame of film, or if it's an optical trick using her reflection. But it's a unique image, and that is a portrait that is also a self-portrait of the image taker. And this last one is just marvelously surreal with both her shadow and reflection. Very nicely composed. I think what is amazing about her work as a whole is that it is obvious by the content that her work is mid 20th century, but her aesthetic seems very contemporary. These photographs look like they could have been taken today. I really think Vivian Mayer was ahead of her time. Perhaps it was best that we only just now discovered her. If you would like more information on Vivian Mayer, you can go to www.vivianmayer.com or you can also check out this biography on her at any Fort Bend County library. Next episode, we will switch to an image maker and American photographer Andy Bloxham. And here's a spoiler. The image we will critique, I'm in it. So until next time, keep shooting.